Thank you very much. Now, let us move on to next speaker. Next lecturer is the laureate in the basic sciences, Dr. Michel Mayo. Dr. Mayo, could you please enter the hall? Now, prior to his lecture, let us to introduce his profile. Could you please watch the screen in front? Dr. Michel Mayo was born in 1942 in Lausanne, Switzerland. He has one old elder brother. His father, who was a police officer, often took his family out to hiking and camping. His mother was extremely active and translated her interest into action without hesitation. During his childhood, he was an active member of scouts, skiing, climbing, devoting himself to every kind of outdoor activities. He also had interest in natural sciences. After earning his master's degree in theoretical physics from Lausanne University, he took his doctorate degree in astronomy from Geneva University. Thinking that precise determination of stellar velocity is important in astronomical research, Dr. Mayor made great effort in developing astronomical instrumentation. For many years, people have had a fundamental age-old question. Beyond our solar system, could any planets exist? It was not possible to directly detect planets from distant stars from they do not produce light on their own. But fixed stars with orbiting planets are impacted by their gravity and thus to wobbles periodically. By observing this movement, existence of planets can be detected. Using a jointly developed observational instrument of astonishing accuracy, together with Dr. Didier Kello, he continued to observe the shift or wobble in the wavelength of light that occurs by the movement of the star. In 1995, he at last discovered a planet outside our solar system that orbits a sun-like star. His discovery made a tremendous impact in the astronomical circles, accelerating the search for extrasolar planets, as well as having a significant influence on the enhancement of observational instruments and techniques. As of today, nearly 2,000 planets have been discovered by many observers in the world. Dr. Mayer's discovery has resulted in the advent of a completely new research field where exoplanets, which continue to develop rapidly. Hopes are high for the discovery of a second Earth, which is an exoplanet relatively similar to Earth, as well as of life on another planet. Dr. Mayor continues to work with astronomical observatories throughout the world, including France, Hawaii, and Chile, to further his research. His advice to young people is so many domains of sciences are exciting. Choose what you like to do and just run towards that goal. This is his second visit to Kyoto. He says he wants to enjoy Kyoto in beautiful colors of autumn with his wife.
Today, Dr. Mayo is going to give us his review of origin of research and how he has spent his life as a researcher, including the future hope. He is going to give us his lecture. Title is Extrasolar Planets, an Old Dream of Humanity, a Modern Reality of Astrophysics. Now, Dr. Mayo, please. very proud to be here in Kyoto, but also very happy to have the opportunity to present what I'm doing and what is with this extremely exciting new field of astronomy is the discovery of extrasolar planets in the universe. As you know, we are part of a very big system called the Milky Way Galaxy, with something like 200 billion stars, something similar to our own sun. And evidently, we have the immediate question, already asked for many years, for many centuries, do we have other planetary systems orbiting these stars? Here you have a small, a very small, tiny place in the center of the system, in the galaxy, where you see the, the huge number of stars. So, the problem is not to find new stars. We have plenty of stars, too many stars. The, the question is to, okay, I have to low. Yes, to see, do, do you have a, a planetary system orbiting this star or this one and so on? Do we have, in the, in the old term, terminology, we, we, we would like to say, do we have other worlds in the universe? So this idea is not modern. Already more than 2,000 years ago, the Greek philosopher Epicurus, writing a letter to a colleague, it's a very famous letter, expressed his deep feeling that we should have an infinite number of worlds in the universe. It's not clear if it's world is exactly to, to planet, but, and, and uh, um, this was starting from the point that you should have an infinite number of atoms in the universe, so you don't see why the universe will only realize one world from this atom and not many more. So this question was expanding from more than 2,000 years. So today we are just have the chance, the opportunity to, to, to have the technology to detect these worlds. So, but before discussing the, this domain, I would like to, to give proof, a few hints of my own path uh, to, to this domain. So, I did my school starting first from Lausanne in Switzerland, but due to the change of, of function of my father, I moved to a different place, and, uh, and I, I stayed only a few years in Lausanne. So with my family, we are very, we love to do hiking in the, in the snow, in the forest, skiing, and so on. So as my father moved his function to different place, we moved first to a small village along the lake of Geneva called Cuyi. It's a very small village, it's a vineyard. And then after, due to the second uh, we move in a small town here called Egel, also in the vineyard region. It was not possible to do high school in this small uh, town, so after a few years, uh, I was obliged to move back to do my high school in Lausanne and in science, but in part of the, of, the, of the different activities we have been obliged to do some sculpture and other uh, activities like this, and maybe you have recognized I'm here. After the high school, I moved to the University of Lausanne doing uh, theoretical physics 
at the Lausanne University, and uh, I was very, very glad, very proud to, uh, to have a fascinating professor called the Professor Stuckelberg, and I had a lot, a lot of, of lectures with him. It's, it's one of the major figures in, in physics, and he gave us a vision of physics very deep. Just at the time when I finish the university, I get married with Francoise, and we continue to our love of, of external activities and doing skiing, high altitude skiing, climbing, and things like this. And you see here, Francoise is here. And uh, evidently, this kind of activity is not without any possible byproduct. And for example, in 68, I just missed the risk to to not have the opportunity to discover 51 Pegasi. <laughs> but happy to, the end was very glad, they were very happy. <laughs> so, uh, here is the family, some think like uh, a little bit less than 40 years ago, with our three children, you can maybe see them in the room here, and uh, one boy and two daughters. And two days is for the same family, Enlarge quite a bit, and here you have seen this. Uh, you can see the, the mix of uh, quite different scientific activity. I'm very glad to uh, to see that all the all our children got the virus of of scientific research in in physics, archaeology, uh, neuropsychology, and others. And evidently, you have the third generation here. So. This is very smooth way to go to the to do the the physics to the study of physics, and now I will try to to give some hints on on the domain of extrasolar planet. In fact, as I did my PhD and my master first in theoretical physics, I started my PhD also in in theoretical domain of of astrophysics. I started a PhD at the Geneva uh, University. And at the time, uh, it was a big success achieved by two, two professors, uh, Chinese and uh, American professor Lin and Shu, to, to understand how it's possible to have this big uh, pattern of galaxies. Just to realize the, 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 lumin the light will, will need something like 100,000 years to cross this huge, it's a huge, huge uh, system, and it was absolutely not easy to understand what was the mechanism to form this kind of system. So this was pro uh, published in '63. So it was a very nice topic, and I started my PhD in that domain, and the the more specific problem I was looking for was, do we have the, the sun in our own galaxy? This is not our own galaxy. We have not the possibility to go out to take the picture, but it's a similar galaxy. Uh, the sun <coughs> on, on, on such a picture will have a, 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 some kind of, of uh, position outside of the, of the system here. And we are surrounded by a lot of stars, and do we have the possibility to, to detect the flow of stars induced by this kind of, of structure? So this was a, the typical topic I tried to solve. But when I finished my PhD, I, I, I was expecting to have the possibility to test if it is correct. And so for that, we need to have a large sample of the velocity of all the stars around us. And so the next question is evidently how to get, I don't know, 1,200 precise velocity. At the time, in the catalog of stars, because already many people have done such measurements, uh, we do not have what, what I need at the time. So this was really the critical move in the domain of instrumentation, starting from, from uh, theory, moving to, to instrumentation with a specific uh, focus on the determination of stellar in kinematics. So, and I'm very sensitive to, to some chance, some 
unexpected change in your life you can have. And for example, I went in Cambridge in the 70s just for a theoretical uh, meeting in theory, in the mind of theory, and just during the coffee break, I have a very interesting discussion with a, a local professor, Dr. Roche Griffin, and he was trying to develop a new kind of instrumentation to measure velocities. So I was really impressed by this technique. It, it was evident we can do uh, much progress in this domain because the, 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 this instrument was not with the most extreme possibility of technology. So when I went to, to Geneva, I, I asked the permission to the, to the director at the time to, to, to develop such kind of cross-correlation spectrograph. This is a term of this kind of instrument. And uh, as I, I, I'm, I was not an optician, so I went to, to, Bar, uh, to, to France in Marseille and uh, check, uh, I discussed with a colleague and express my problem, and he said, oh, it's so interesting, I will do the optics myself to help you. So this is a way, sometimes it's working in science, it's, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it could be very easy to collaborate with people. And uh, just to, 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 to illustrate the, the key uh, point of this uh, technique, when you disperse the, the light of a star, you have thousands, something like maybe more than 10,000 of atomic transition in the atmosphere, creating some kind of dark line. Imagine this will be the blue, this will be the red, but it's not a continuous uh, spectrum, but you have a lot, a lot of dark uh, absorption line. W due to the motion of the star, you will have a small change of this pattern of line due to the, what is called the Doppler effect. So all the problem will be to measure the velocity of star will be first to disperse the luminosity with the different colors and then to measure precisely the position of this line. The theory is easy. But the fact that stars are very faint, you don't have so many photons. So how to concentrate all this Doppler information here on one single quantity, the velocity. This was the idea proposed already in 53 by, by uh, Felget, but not realized before that period. So this is the real key. So we have a huge possibility to improve the precision and the efficiency just concentrating this information. So we start to build this instrument. This is a view of the Haute Provence Observatory in South of France with uh, several telescopes. In fact, we were using, at the beginning, we were using another telescope out of the screen here, and we installed our first cross correlation spectrometer. This is a small black box here. It's only a one meter telescope, so the size of the mirror is one meter telescope. And it was <coughs> a very exciting period of my life because the, the increase of precision, of efficiency, was 4,000. So wh when, when you have a, uh, such a gain, you don't have to be clever. Every domain is open to you. It's, it, it's so fascinating to have a so uh, big break in, in efficiency. So during almost 20 years, I did a lot of kinematics, dynamics of stars in globular clusters, and so on, the pulsation of stars, and everything. Evidently, the precision was not at the level to detect planets at the time. Okay, I, I spent quite a lot of time in, the, in this observatory, about two months a year. So, when we had the possibility during school vacation on other, it was a pleasure to take the family. Uh, and for example, you see, it was also a pleasure for the family once they had the possibility. And you can recognize the next generation of physicists here. 20, almost 20 years after the first step, the first generation of spectrograph, the director of the French Observatory, Haute Provence, 
ask us, Bahan and myself, if we, we, have the we have the possibility to develop a new instrument taking advantage of the, the progress of technology. And this was uh, what we called the name of LOD spectrograph. It's the second in this series. And evidently, uh, this spectrograph used a lot of new critical device, optical fibers and CCD and so on, and with the possibility to put the, the, the instrument underground below the telescope to have a big stability. In science, uh, it's very exceptional. You, you can do the things by yourself. You need, at least when you are building an instrument. And here it's part of the team having built the spectrograph uh, LOD. I will not give the name of all these people. I will just mention the chief optician, André Baran, uh, Didier Kello, having done his PhD also on, the, on some aspect of this instrument, and other people, computer scientists, opticians, mechanicers, and so on. So what is the idea to detect the planet? Planets are not producing any luminosity. They just reflect a tiny part of the re luminosity received from the star. So let's exam let, let look at the solar system. Jupiter will reflect something like one billionth of the luminosity of the sun. So if you are at some distance, you will be completely dominated by the luminosity of the star, and you have no possibility to see the, the planet itself. So we have been obliged to use an indirect technique. So when you have the star here, you have the planet orbiting here, you cannot see the planet, but you see that the star is moving around the gravity center of the system, and you have a shift of the wavelengths the Doppler effect when the planet is moving, inducing some gravitational wobble on the star itself. So this is uh, the idea. It's indirect technique. And we start a new program to search for planet in 1994. We got, we have to compete to get the telescope time. It's not automatic. So we got one week every two months to search for planet. And evidently, we have a very large sample of stars, more than 100 stars, so similar to our sun. So during the first period, we got four measurements for 51 pet. Evidently, we don't have the, the curve. It's a four. And two months later, we have eight additional measurements. So it was the end of 84. We start to have the first hints that something special arrived with the star. And the domain of the detection of extracellular planets had a very bad reputation at the time. Because during the 50 years before, the last 50 years of the 20th century, many claim was done of discoveries of planets, and then after, uh, shown to be wrong. So it's part of the reason why we have decided to postpone the publication for an additional season. And in July 95, with Didier, we went to Haute Provence Observatory and we had new eight measurements. You see here. And this was enough to check that the signal was really stable. What was the claim, uh, the, 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 the risk? In, uh, okay, we were sure of our measurements. But we have the risk that a bad interpretation, because we can be misleaded by different other pro physical process. For example, you have all processes related with the magnetic activity of the sun. If the sun is rotating, or the star, the star is rotating with some spots, they can mimic something similar to that. So it was it was part of our concern, and. The second one was maybe more fundamental. The theory predicts that giant planets can be formed only where in the place of a disk where you have dust particles. 
And evidently, if you have an object with a period as short as four days, because this was the parameters, uh, uh, four days of orbiting period. The Earth took 365 days, Jupiter 10 years, and here you have a planet with a period as short as four days. And this was completely crazy compared to the, to, to the formation mechanism expected at the time. And uh, so this was, okay, one additional reason why we have to be careful and to wait. And it's only in July 95 that we have enough measurement to see, to check the stability and say, so, okay, we have a problem, we have exactly this kind of thing. We do not understand how it is possible to produce such a short period of planet, but we are certain, and so we have decided to publish. So here with Didier in the dome of the 3.6 meter telescope in Haute Provence, okay, we are happy. Uh, so, going back to this problem of the, of the this, if you have here, this is an artistic view, it's not possible to have such a picture of the real object. You have a star sim, almost similar to our own sun. You have a Jupiter, very close, very close. So the temperature on this planet will be more than 100 Kelvin degree. It's, it's very hot. And what, what, how, what is the possibility to, 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 for the formation? You don't have ice particles here to form such a planet. But happily, you, we have colleagues in the world, and immediately they rush to understand this problem. And uh, in the coming few weeks after the announcement, the, the answer arrived. And this is really a phenomenal part of the modern view of the formation of, of planetary system. And it was, in fact, it's very strange because it was already part of the literature, but never, nobody have, have taken sufficiently into account this paper before. So if you have a disk of dust and, partic and, uh, and gas here, this is simulation, aerodynamic simulation, and you form a young planet here, this planet will induce by this gravity some kind of waves in the, in the density of the dust particle and gas in this. And this excess of matter will react on the motion of the planet. And this is explanation. The planet will do something like this, moving uh, in direction of the star itself. We still have a lot of problems to understand. If the, the first idea is are simple, in fact, the detail is more complicated than this. For example, how to stop the migration? Why the planet didn't, do not disappear inside the star, and so on. We continued in, in Haute Provence Observatory to, to search planets in the northern sky, but so we moved to the southern sky because Europe has a, an observatory called La Silla Observatory uh, in south of the desertic part of Chile with several telescopes. And we have implemented first a, a, a 1.2 meter telescope with a copy of LOD here, and later another spectrograph on the big telescope 3.6. In parallel, evidently, a lot of different, different teams in the world start to, to search planets, uh, and some of them have been, been started before, in fact, uh, to search for planets. And what we have learned about these last 20 years, for, I believe, the, okay, existence of planets, okay, first. The second thing is uh, the fact that we have a lot, a lot of planetary system, but with a huge diversity of, um, of shapes. They are not only copies of our own solar system. If, if we can repeat in few words what are the most characteristic points of the solar system, you have four rocky planets in, in, in the inner part, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. And then after, you have two big giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn and two high sea planets, Uranus and Neptune. And they are moving all in the same direction around the sun, almost all in a flat pla uh, disk. 
and with almost circular orbit. And here, if you are look, looking at this plane, this is the shape of the orbit, the eccentricity of the orbit. When it is circular, it's zero. Here, here at 0.9 or 0.8, correspond to extremely elongated orbit. We do not have any planet in the solar system like this, but here you can see this is the most visible characteristic of the planet discoveries during the, the 10, 15 years of, of search. So the, the solar system planet on such a graph will be, the Earth will be here, Jupiter will be here, so all the solar system planets will be here. So this, we have to face the difficulty to understand the very complex mechanism of formation of planetary system. They are not simple, they are not similar to our own one, simply. From that time, we, we, uh, a lot of planets have been discovered. Presently, I don't know exactly how many we are. Uh, at least about 2,000 2, planets discovered by different techniques, and an additional maybe 3,000 candidates to be confirmed. We know that at least 70% of, of stars have planetary system, maybe more, probably more. We have planets with a full range between the mass of the Earth and, and 20 times the mass of Jupiter. We have periods as short as 0.3 days. Let's imagine a planet with a period of only a few hours, very close to the star, and so on. So we have a huge distribution of characteristics of planetary systems. Next step, evidently, the sensitivity of the spectrograph we are using allows to detect lower, lower mass planet. This is part of the quest of rocky planet, because if Jupiter induces a change of the velocity of the sun at the level of 11 meters per second, the Earth induce a change of the velocity of the sun of only eight centimeters per second. So you have, a, to, you have the need to, to have a huge improvement of the precision if you want to detect rocky planet, and evidently we will go back why we are interested by rocky planet. So uh, we, we have been able to design a new instrument, much more sophisticated, with an, working in vacuum with a very high contr temperature control. It's a few milli, milli, degree, uh, milli Kelvin degrees during the night. So it's very stable temperature and so on. And so we put this instrument on a 3.6 meter telescope. 3.6 is the size of the mirror. So you need a lot of photons to, to, to be precise. So, uh, modern astronomers are never looking by high. Stop this kind of view of you can have in the mind. We are never looking inside an eyepiece, but we are looking computer screen, and during the night you are giving order to move the telescope, start the measurement with the spectrograph, and so on. During the last 20 years, all the teams having worked in the domain during the last 20 years, have done tremendous project, progress of precision. So here this is a plot of the mass of the planet detected, one, one ma Earth mass, 10 Earth mass, 100 Earth mass, 1,000 Earth mass here, and here is the discovery year, 95, 51 peg here, and then after you can see the huge galore of of discoveries, uh, but also what is maybe more striking is a huge increase of the precision. If we have here 150 times the mass of the Earth, 51 peg, here we arrive at the level of the mass of the Earth. This is a, a reason why we have done so much progress during this last 20 years. I will certainly not show you the 2000 planet discovered. I will just show one example. This example was discovered a couple of years ago, and what it is. This, 
every red dot here correspond to one measurement, one night. You see that it's a lot, it's 2,000 nights here. It's a long period of several years. Each set of measurements correspond to one season. So at the end of several years, you have this huge scatter, you don't see anything here on this thing. But when you let the computer doing the correct analysis of data, you see that you have several planets orbiting the same stars. And so it's a full planetary system here. And in the middle, it's a very packed system with several planets on short period. One day, five days, 16 days, and so on. We do not have something similar to in the solar system. So this is just an example of the diversity. You can ask me, what is the reason to continue to search for planets when you have already 2,000 planets? Uh, in fact, the, the goal is not to detect an additional planet. Today, okay, at the beginning it was the case, but today this is certainly not very interesting to add uh, an additional planet. What is interesting is to have a global view of this domain, to, be, to have the possibility to, to, de to determine or to, to build the theory to understand the formation of planetary system and, in particular, the, the formation of our own planetary system. What are the mechanics involved in this domain? And so, you see this plot, for example. Here, we are the observation done with different parameters, uh, shape of the orbit, mass, uh, distance between the planet and the, and, and the star, and, and so on. And you see that you can compare this observation with the theory. And here it is done in, in, in Japan. Here you have people able to, uh, to put all the physics involved in the formation of planetary system and try to compare if we have the good theory to, to explain the form formation of planetary system. It's a lot of mechanism, and maybe you are wrong, maybe you have done not the good input in the theory. So when you, you have this dialogue between observation and theory, you have a chance to, to, to do some progress in, in this, this domain. We had a very uh, nice additional possibility to detect planets uh, issued from the fact that some of these planets have very short period. If you have a star here, you have a planet orbiting like this, nothing very special happens. But if the planet orbits like this around the star, you have a chance that the orbital plane is just uh, in the direction where you will have a planetary transit. Planetary transit is equivalent to a tr an eclipse. So if you have an eclipse, you have a fascinating possibility because the, you will have a small drop of the luminosity, periodic drop of the luminosity, and evidently the, de the, the de depths of this, of this luminosity dimming is directly proportional to the size of the planet, or the, in fact, to the, uh, to the square of the size. So we, 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 deter we discovered a planet with a period of 3.5 days, already 15 years ago, and you see this is uh, the velocity versus the time here, and you can predict that maybe here you have a chance to have the good orientation of the plane. And we gave this information to, to some colleague having a small telescope, 10 centimeter telescope. It's fascinating, you can do say, front research with a so small telescope. And exactly at the good time, they observe the small deep. Seven days after, two period, you observe again. And this is very useful. The Doppler spectroscopy gives access to the mass of the planet this technique gives access to the, to the size of the planet. If you have the radius of the planet, the mass of the planet, you have the mean density of the planet, and it's a direct proof that it's really a gaseous giant planet and not a, I don't know, a different kind of body. 
this was really the, the, the definitive proof that we really had discovered planets. This was the measurement you saw just before, obtained by Antigrone in 1999, and uh, two of our colleagues in the state asked time for the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is the same measurement done from the space. Okay, the scale has changed, but it's the same phenomena, but look at the quality of what you can have when you are in the, in, in the space. Absolutely fascinating precision. And this was really at the root of the development of several space missions, one in, in, in Europe called COHO, and then later on, much more ambitious mission called the Kepler mission, uh, launched by NASA. And here I will not too much spend time on this discovery. So the idea, the technique is very difficult, but the idea is very simple. Let's imagine you have a telescope looking continuously during three years around the Earth, looking at the same place on the sky. You are measuring precisely the luminosity of 100,000 stars. And at the end, you have a full catalog of objects with small deep like this. So, and this is the galore of this mission. You have here the radius measured of all these targets versus the period here. So every point you have here corresponds to a planet, a planetary system. So the first season, it's the blue points. After the second season, it's the red one. The third season, it's the yellow one. And after the telescope, had some, the space mission had some problem. So we do not have really explored the domain of long period, low mass object, but already it's several thousand of objects discovered here. With this fantastic mission, we obtain a lot of planetary systems. We can do a lot of statistics, but you don't have the mass of planets. This gives the size of the planet, but not the mass. So if you want to have access to the mass, you need to do Doppler spectroscopy, as I said before. Unhappily, the fields from Kepler are in the northern hemisphere, and our ARP spectrograph at LACIA is the southern sky, so we have been obliged to develop a new instrument installed at La Palma in Canary Island. It's a copy of the first one. Okay, it's a fascinating instrument. And this instrument was really built to explore the most difficult, the lowest mass object discovered by the Kepler mission. And with a special focus on the, to understand the composition of, of rocky planet. And this, uh, I'm sorry for the technical diagram. But <laughs> here, this is the size of the planet detected by Kepler as a function of the mass detected by Doppler spectroscopy. And every, okay, you have here the Venus and the Earth. Evidently, if you have the same composition that we have for Venus and Earth, but you have a larger, a more massive planet, the size of the planet will increase on this blue ridge here. And so uh, here are the observations we did. This one, this one, this one, and so on and so on. So you see that up to five times the mass of the Earth, you have rocky planet. It's possible to have rocky planet. But above this period, you change the physical content, the constitution of planet, and you have some kind of of uh, Neptune or Uranus type planets. So we continue this kind of ex exploration to try to understand the huge diversity of composition of, of planetary system. Because in every of these lines correspond to different kind of composition of planetary system. So next step. A lot of people would like to detect really Earth twins. It's low mass planet. This is already detected. We know that we have a huge number of rocky planets in the universe. This is not the problem. 
The problem is to detect them, if possibly as close as possible to us to do follow-up studies. And in the region where you have a temperature at the surface of the planet, where maybe the complex chemistry for life development will have a chance to be developed. So this is really the question. Do we have the possibility to detect site uh, uh, convenient for life development with uh, present instrumentation or in the coming soon instrumentation? So to detect an object something like this. This is a rocky planet. Maybe you are not convinced because it's blue, mostly it's water. So you can do the experiment. You take an orange, you take the orange in the water, you do something like this, you shake it. The thin film of water on top of the fruit will be in the same proportion of the, as we have on the Earth. So, so the quantity of water on the Earth is only really a teeny film of water. But evidently quite interesting in the context of where we are working. And why we are so fascinated by this, by this kind of, of object is the fact that maybe it is the most convenient place to have a chance to have the development of the chemistry for life development. You have the advantage, you have the advantage of the temperature. If it, if, if it will be much hotter, you have no chance to have uh, stability of the DNA, transmission of life from one generation to another one. If it's too cold, the chemistry is too low, nothing very interesting happens. So you have a, definite, a small range of temperature, almost corresponding to the domain where you have water, liquid water. In addition, water is, a, is an incredible solvent to facilitate chemistry. So it's a reason. It's not anthropomorphism. It's really physics and chemistry if we are focusing on this domain. So the, the big question we have here, not for us, but for the next generation, is to, to try to, to progress on this important question. Is life a cosmic imperative? What is the meaning of this sentence? Cosmic imperative means simply that if you have all the good uh, uh, conditions for life development, life will emerge. By maybe, I don't know, we don't know, it's a very complex change of, of reaction, but life is, is something, is a kind of byproduct of the evolution of the universe. Nobody, if it's true or not, but we know that it's possible to answer this question just doing spectroscopy of planetary atmosphere of extra extrasolar planet. It's difficult, expensive, expensive in terms of space mission, complex space mission and so on, but I'm sure that if this question exists already from 2000 years, I'm sure that we, are, we will not give up at the, at the moment where technology allows to answer this kind of fundamental question. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will present a bouquet of flowers uh, to Dr. Mayo. Thank you very much. Please uh, give him a big applause once again. <laughs> 